year that we have with us, Professor Vino Calabresi, one of our scientific directors, one of the uh, founders of this uh, institution, the International University College of Turin. Professor Vigo Calabresi is also one of the founders of law and economics, as, it, as we understand it today. And in fact, this first lecture will be on the history and meaning of law and economics. We will have another two lectures, one this afternoon on economics, altruism, and not-for-profits, uh, not and the third one tomorrow morning on shaping tastes and values. So, first, uh, let me tell you that I wear two hats. Uh, for the last 17 years, I've been a judge of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit. That's after the Supreme Court of the United States, probably the most important court in the United States. It is the equivalent of a court of cassation in many different countries. And uh, I've been doing that while still teaching, because I can't do without teaching. Before that, I, I taught. I started teaching more than 50 years ago. I'm that old. I mean, people like Hugo Matei, these people are all my children. In fact, most of these characters around are my children. I mention that because while the three lectures that I will give uh, are all academic, that is, I'm talking about law and economics and the future of law and economics in various theory areas, like altruism and the shaping of values and tastes, the last something that people have not talked about at all. Uh, I'm, I'm also here at your disposal for these other things, so that I'll talk you know, for a while and then open things up for questions. And the questions can be not just on what I'm talking about, law and economics and various things, but anything else that you want to ask about the role of the judge uh, in the United States and in a common law situation, but particularly in the United States, where we are generalists. I know everything, uh, not just constitutional or criminal or civil or bankruptcy, I do all. I can manage. How do I do that? Uh, and also, the particular thing that may be of interest to you of what a judge does when the law is wrong. Not just wrong, but immoral. What does a judge like me do in the United States when there is a death penalty case? And if I one thinks as I do, that the death penalty is wrong. So all of those, and I just say that because I am here for these two days, and I'm at your disposal to answer questions beyond the very important and serious and fun things I'll be talking about, but also wearing my other hat as well. Okay, so let's start with law and economics and where it comes from and what it is. Now, at the moment, it's a very big deal. It's very important in American law and in many countries. But I think to understand where it fits in the system of law, one has to step back and realize that it is only one part of what is one quarter of ways of looking at law. In this last century, there have been four ways of looking at law and legal scholarship. The traditional one, the classic one, which most of you will have had in most countries, in Europe, in South America, and so on, is the traditional formalistic way, which says law and legal scholarship is to try to make either the common law or the codes coherent consistent with each other. The job is to see when there are things which are inconsistent, make them consistent, straighten it all out, but don't get into underlying values, underlying reasons for it. You just have inherited. How did they get there? Who knows? But there they were. 
That was the classic, classic way. Now, the problem with that was that it led to a kind of tyranny. A tyranny either of the past, whatever is there is there, and we can't do anything about it. Law seemed independent, and that was nice, but it was dominated by whatever structure had been put in before. It was very hard to reform. And that was a tyranny, therefore, either of the past or of revolution. Because one way would be to say, get rid of all that was there and make a new consistency. Uh, or, in some instances, of a majority. Whatever a majority put in and set up as a new thing, that would be that. Against this, a tradition which actually went back into the 19th century, with Bentham primarily, and John Stuart Mill, of saying, give me a place to stand on, a place where I can look, and from outside of law, and criticize law, in a rational, scholarly way. Let me bring in some outside field, social science, to tell me that the rules of law that we've inherited are wrong. And that radical reform became the beginning of what is now law and economics, but many, many other things. The key to it was something outside law to allow me to criticize law, to change it, to make it better. Uh, now what are these outside places? It could be economics, it could be philosophy, it could be history, that is, you could look at history and look at things in a different way. You could look at it philosophically. But it could even be literature. What were the relationships in the great canonic pieces of literature that told you what made sense as against what rules which were there did not make sense? And the interesting thing is that different as these things are from each other, the technique of doing a law and movement is totally different. They are the same one to the other and totally different from the classical formal way of just trying to make the law coherent. Law and economics was one of these. It was an outside place to stand on from which you could put a leader to change the legal world. Now, in the 1930s, there came a reaction against this, primarily at Harvard. The law and movement took a particular began in some ways in the United States at Yale, for reasons which I may mention later. There was a reaction at Harvard to this, uh, which said, but that makes law too dependent on outside disciplines. It makes law the servant of these other disciplines. And they're not that good themselves. Can't we find something, something which is just law. It doesn't have anything to do with these. And there arose at Harvard a school, uh, the legal process school, which said what law should be concerned with is not so much the result, but who should decide. Should it be a court? Should it be a jury? Should it be a legislature? Should it be an administrative agency that makes a particular decision? 
Now that's a very interesting question and a good question for lawyers to study. But people who do that do something very different from a kind of law and and from a kind of formalist traditional law. And again, they, they differ among themselves, but they are similar in technique to each other in relation to each of these others. Finally, I think there is a fourth approach to law and legal scholarship, which hasn't been as recognized, but which has been there throughout all of this time, which is to say, I will use each of these others, but I won't use them generally. I will use them by focusing on a particular group. So, if the first was concerned with consistency, instead of being concerned with consistency in general, this, which I call law and status, asked, but how, what is the consistency when it deals with a racial, <coughs> ethnic, or gender group? Now, in the 19th century, that was done for law and the elect, law and the elite. In the 20th century in the United States, for a short time during the New Deal, it was law and the working man. Not law and poverty, but law and the working man. Then, for a very short time, it's the only time it has been focused on that way, during the Lyndon Johnson administration was law and the poor. A very little. It almost didn't last. At the same time, starting with the terrible case of Karamatsu uh, during the war, and then with Brown versus Board of Education, law and race. And notice how different things look from a consistency point of view, from a law and point of view, or from anything else, if you look at it from a particular group. And I'll have a little bit more to say about that. I use an example of these. And more recently, extremely important, law and feminism, law and women, gender and law, and also sexual orientation and both. All of which are ways of asking each of the other questions. What is the consistency? What does economics or philosophy or whatever say when you look at it from this point of view? Who is best suited to make rules when you're talking about one of these? And so on. Now, think for a moment about what may seem like a science fiction question, but is not really a science fiction question because it comes up, it will come up all the time, of whether we own our bodies or our body parts. It may seem like science fiction, but there was a case not that long ago, but some time ago in the United States, of a man who needed a bone marrow transplant to live. And the only person who had a good bone marrow that was suitable was his cousin. And his cousin was afraid, because it was painful at the time, to donate his bone marrow. And so said no. So, the one who needed the bone marrow did what any red-blooded American would do. He sued. <laughs> he sued. He said, the bone marrow is mine because I need it. He doesn't need it. Oh, it's mine. And the court looked at it from, as courts will do, from a fairly traditional point of view, formalistic point of view, and said, no, the person who has the bone marrow owns it. Or at least, they said, I cannot force a person who has it to give it up to the other. Interestingly, it left open the question 
of whether the person who needed it or his estate could sue for damages. That was a different question from can I force him to give it to me? And it also left open the most important question of all of whether if a law were passed saying the bone marrow belongs to the person who needs it, whether that law would be valid under a constitution. It seems unlikely, but imagine a situation in which there were a generalized Chernobyl and people needed bone marrow and there were not enough donors and a law was passed which said everybody who has good bone marrow is put into the army. Let's just say that. Because remember, when you're in the army, you don't own your body anymore. And then we'll take your bone marrow. Would such a law be constitutional? Very likely, yes. So, that was a real case. As it happened, you know, as judges, you see cases, but you don't know what happens afterwards. I do know that the person who needed the bone marrow died for giving his cousin. Uh, what happened to his cousin, I don't know whether he's toasting in hell with good bone marrow, uh, or whether he is living it up with his good bone marrow, or what, I don't know. I don't know. But imagine that question looked at from each of my points of view. The first one, which is what the court did, said, now look, traditionally, if you have a body part, it is yours. You own it. No one can take it away. But it is not so 100% that it couldn't be changed by statute. It isn't so fundamental as to be constitutionally required. Because people get taken into the army and their bodies don't belong to them at all. That's kind of a tradition. Now look at it from any of different law and points of view. If you look at it from a law and philosophy point of view, if you're a Kantian, you say, oh no, people can never be means. They must always be ends. You own your bone now. If you look at it from a Marxist point of view, or from an early Christian point of view, from each according to what they have, to each according to their needs, the bone marrow belongs to a person who needs it. A lawyer economist of that school would say, from each according to his ability, to each according to their utility, or some other stupidly said economic way of talk. Uh, a Rawlsian would say, what would you say behind the veil if you didn't know whether you needed the bone marrow or you had the bone marrow? Probably behind the veil, somebody might say, at least as to bone marrow from people who are dead, and certainly say, let it go. And maybe they make a difference between bone marrow and kidneys and blood and other things. Now, what I'm saying is that each of these schools of law and philosophy might come out differently with the result, but notice that their way of analyzing is very similar to each other and totally different from simply what do the cases, what do the legal landmarks tell you of a formalistic approach. With those contrast law and economics, which is just one sub part, which would might say, well, uh, what is the most efficient way? We have too much bone marrow or too many kidneys, and therefore they should be allocated in this way. But somebody else might say, oh, well, if everybody can get bone marrow or kidney, uh, regardless of whether they take care of them, then people wouldn't take care of their bone marrows and kidneys, 
and it would be a disaster. And then somebody else would say, but it wouldn't work that way. Notice different schools of law and economics. Uh, and it wouldn't work that way because the same things that destroy your bone marrow and kidneys, if you live wrong, also destroy your heart. And there is no heart for transplant. But anyway, uh, you can have different schools of law and economics which would tell you different results. And they would look at it differently from law and philosophy, or law and religion, or law and history, or law and literature. But all of them would look to an outside source to tell you what makes sense, rather than law in itself. Now, there are also, some would say, that what are the distributional consequences? That's what people at Yale in the Yale Law and Economics would do. In Chicago, they would look just at the efficiency. Chicago, by the way, is not geographical, it's a state of mind. Uh, and it, it's a way of thinking about things, rather than. Uh, each of these make a considerable difference. If you look at distribution, you may think about these very differently from the other. Let me give you an example. There was a woman in the United States who had very rare blood. Because she had very rare blood, she became a multi-millionaire. She could sell her blood to people who needed it. All sorts of people died because they couldn't afford to buy that rare blood. Now turn it around and say her blood belongs to those who need it. All sorts of people would live, but she would become a cow to be milked. Her life would be quite horrible. Maybe you could compensate her. Totally different if you look just from an efficiency point of view, or also from a law in economics, the distributional point of view. And yet all of these are ways which are similar in way of looking in relation to the formalistic way. By the way, this story is kind of interesting because a woman ended up going to jail. And she went to jail because she didn't pay taxes <laughs> on the sale of her blood. And she didn't pay taxes on the sale of her blood because she said it was a capital asset. But she didn't know the basis. And so couldn't figure out what the gain was to pay tax. And the court said, no, you could have figured it out and paid it. Uh, that was an argument that it worked for Richard Nixon on the property and it didn't work for her. Which all says that maybe part of our body is owned by the tax people. Now, okay. Now, with that contrast, the legal process which says, who can best decide whether a body part belongs to you or to someone else? A legislature? A court? Is it an issue which each case must be looked at by itself, in which case a jury, which is representative, does best, or something which repeats itself, which a court? Or is it something in which generic, abstract rules are best made? in which case a legislature. So, uh, again, different schools of legal process exist that we don't have to go into it today. But while they exist, they, uh, and might be different results, they look at things the same way. And now contrast each of these with the law and status, law from a particular point of view. Oh yes, it looks traditionally as if our bodies are owned by those who have them. Wait a moment. When you start looking from the standpoint of race and law, you know perfectly well that in the United States, blacks did not own their bodies. No, they belonged to owners. There was slavery, and even after slavery, to a very substantial extent, it remained that way. Women, to a very substantial extent, did not own their bodies. 
There's a woman in Iowa pushing some wonderful, wonderful articles demonstrating that the one area in which contracts of employment were made virtually unbreakable, that is, you didn't break them and pay damages, but there were specific performance required, were those areas of employment in which, like singing and things like that, which were predominantly feminine. Because as to women, they were required to do things. They didn't own their bodies in that sense. They couldn't say no. Again, there are different schools dealing with different things in that, but they look at them differently. I've given you that both because I think it's fun, and I wrote an article about that in Stanford some years ago, about four approaches to owning body parts, and I use two kids. But also because it puts law and economics in a funny context. Here we have one small way of looking at law and reforming law in a law and way, which uses economics as the outside discipline, the lever for which to change the world. Now, its history, other than probably that Bentham and some judges in England in the 19th century used it in the reform of court law and in other things, is something like this. In the United States, at the beginning of the 20th century, end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century, a strong desire to reform law from outside, a law and movement developed. Developed first at Yale, actually for reasons which had more to do with the, the monies that the law school had, but it's the fact that in the late 19th century, William Graham Sumner, who was the founder of sociology as a discipline, taught economics in the law school at Yale. And while other schools, Harvard, uh, Columbia, and so on, were developed the case method in very formalistic ways of looking at it, the Yale approach already began there to look at law and as a way of changing. But while this was being, at the beginning, it wasn't particularly law and economics that was used. It was law and sociology, law and any number of other things to see whether law made sense. Economics was used first in the beginning of the 20th century and through the 20s to look at those areas of law that were specifically economic, antitrust, monopoly law, which looked as though the aim of the law was to do something which sounded like economic efficiency or something like that. Taxation, a man named Seligman did some work on that. Interestingly, then it got dropped out, and it's only now that people are doing economic analysis of taxation. It's an area that fell out. And that, throughout the early 20th century, uh, mid-20th century. Some of those articles were quite bad, actually. William O. Douglas, who went to the Supreme Court, who was a crazy man, brilliant, but absolutely crazy. I have all sorts of stories about how crazy he was. Uh, well, wrote an article on court's law and economics, which it was very bad as an economics article, but made it quite famous because it was such a new kind of thing in the mid-20s. Uh, around 19, the mid-1950s, two people started from quite different points of view looking at law from an economic point of view, but not just in the traditional areas. One greater of the two was Ronald Coase, who had, uh, and who was not, now Chicago likes to claim him, 
but he was not in Chicago. He was an Englishman who in the 1920s had written a very important article that nobody paid any attention to, which I'll come back to, the nature of the firm. Uh, and then, in the 1950s, 60s, he published in 1961, both stated 1960. When he was in Virginia, he published a very important article, A Problem of Social Cost, in which all the examples of law and economics that he used were examples we came from courts and property. At the same time, I started writing as a student, right there, law school, from 55 to 58. I didn't publish my first, the article that I wrote, because the people of the law journal didn't understand it and didn't think it very good. They made me an officer of the Law Journal, but I convinced them not to publish it because they didn't like it, and I knew that if they didn't like it, nobody would pay any attention. I went off and clerked for Justice Black, and the Supreme Court came back into teaching in 1959 and immediately published my article which came out in January of 1961, a couple of months before Kosa's article, though the two were completely independent of each other, which applied economics to look at the law of torts and the law of property. That is, areas which were not essentially economic, but said, what happens if you use this law end in this area? And uh, this, coming as it did, completely revolutionized in the United States a way of looking at law. It became a law and reform <coughs> that just took off. And I've got more to say about what it did and why in the United States and why much less so for certain reasons in Europe for a while. Now, what this did was to say you can look at the areas of law that are not primarily economics, but which had economic consequences, and say, what would an economist say about this? Typical law Somebody else might say, what would a philosopher say, and whatever. Uh, there are some backgrounds to this. If you're interested, I can tell you that, you know, I thought I was very original, but the reason that I saw what I saw while studying torts was that an economist of the law school faculty who then went off and did other things and put together the torts materials in the 1920s and asked a lot of economic questions, which a kid like me who had studied economics before going to law school would say, oh, here are some answers to it, which the traditional torts teachers didn't pass. Okay. It's very worthwhile looking at the literature of from 1960 to 1970, which is when I and Coase were writing and the whole debate on it. Because it's rather different from the literature developed after, in 1970, I published my book, The Costs of Action. The importance of the cost of accidents, apart from the area of law that it did in what it said, was that one person, there were three very important reviews of it. The best at the time was by a man named Frank Michaelman, who was now retired from Harvard, who did law and economics and applied it into the property area very well. But there was another review by a man named Richard Posner, who was a young teacher 
and he began his review rather startlingly. For him, seeing what happened after. I am not a courts professor, but then, in a way, neither is Guido Calabresi, because I was talking about courts in an economic point of view. Now, this is startling for Posner, seeing what happened after. He became those awful converts who become more converted than the originals themselves. He became totally sold on uh, economics and law, and did something which was very interesting, but wasn't a change. He made law and economics into economic analysis of law. And that seems like a small change. In fact, most people don't think of it as being any different. But the difference is fundamental. What Posner did was to take an economic theory and look at law and say, if it fits, that's fine. If it doesn't fit, it's irrational. It makes no sense. The world makes no sense if the economic theory does not explain it. A step back. In the 19th century, John Stuart Mill was asked who the seminal minds of the century were. He answered, interestingly, Coleridge, the poet. Interesting to think of Mill saying that Coleridge is what he said. And of course, Bentham. And of Bentham, he said, he approached all ideas as a stranger. It's a nice song. He approached all ideas as a stranger. And if they did not fit his theory, utilitarianism, he dismissed them as vague generalities. Nonsense, nonsense on stilts. And then Mill said what he did not realize was that in those vague generalities lay the whole unanalyzed experience of the human race. In the world as it was, which didn't fit the theory, there was a whole unanalyzed experience of the human race, as well as the generalities. And Mill went on to say, oh, of course, it's also centuries of exploitation, rules that make no sense, but somehow the fact that it doesn't fit the theory is not the end of the argument. You have to analyze more. Okay. What's the difference between law and economics and economic analysis of law? Economic analysis of law is like Bentham. You take your theory, you look at law, if it doesn't fit, you discard it, you change it. Law and economics, as I did, as Coase did, as other people do it, is like Mill. You take your theory, economics, you look at law, maybe it fits, maybe it doesn't. If it doesn't fit, you don't discard the world as it is, as irrational or wrong. You say, maybe the theory is not complex enough. Maybe the theory is not complete enough. And go back and change the theory. And then explain that world as it is. But also, you then have a better theory to explain other things as well. And the obvious example of this, for those of you who know the works of Coase, is in the 1920s, he said, 
if markets were costless, as economists at the time took for granted, because it's easier to treat markets as costless, there would be no firms. We would do everything by contract, by market. But there are firms. Is it impossible for economics to take into account the costs of markets? That markets are expensive, that they aren't cheap, that they're sometimes more expensive than command, as in a firm? Of course not. It just was easier for economics not to do that. So he changed that. And from that came the whole theory of markets, costs, transaction costs, and things of that sort, which has been enormously important, not just in explaining the existence of firms, but also in explaining any number of other things. That's the difference between economic analysis of law and law and economics. And early on, actually, somebody saw it, nobody paid much attention. Uh, I was visiting at Cambridge University in England, and I saw in the syllabus for uh, welfare economics that the person who was teaching it had them read things of mine and things of Posner's, and he said, the difference between Posner is that he takes economics, applies it to law, and leaves it at that, while Calabresi always takes economics, looks at law. If a world doesn't fit, then he goes back and changes economic theory. Uh, now, uh, the important thing to realize is that while one tends to think of economic analysis of law as being Posner and Chicago, it doesn't have to be that. You could do economic analysis of law with any theory. You could have Marxist economics and apply it to law, and if it doesn't fit, discard the world. It can be a much more sophisticated than Chicago school, which people like Hansman and Rose Ackerman and other people at Yale and other places do, which is takes into account distribution. But the move, the way of doing economic analysis of law is always the same. Here is the theory, if the world doesn't fit, tough on the world. Well, law and economics also can be start with a Marxist theory, start with a classical Viennese theory, start with a mixed Viennese plus distribution theory, looks at the world, and if the world is still not explained, tries to change <coughs> as well. The thing about it is that it's much easier to do economic analysis of law than to do law and economics. It's much easier to do economic analysis of law because you have this machine and you put things in it turn it off, then it comes out sausages. You know, you apply it here, you apply it there, you apply it there. If you are a young scholar looking to write and get tenure, which is an admirable thing to do, it's very easy to turn this out. It's much harder if when you turn it out, the sausages don't smell right, you say the machine may be wrong. And to do, go back and do the other. So that what happened was that pure economic analysis, which made economics dominant over law, you know, economic is the queen of the sciences, that law is its handmaiden, became extremely popular just because it was easy. <laughs> 
The interesting thing to me is that when you start doing that, of course, and the world doesn't fit, you get all sorts of absurd results. And Posner, when he became a judge, didn't always follow the results of economic analysis of law, which he did as a scholar. He's too good a judge to do that. I tease him and I say, Dick, you're a good scholar, but you're a better judge. Because when he became a judge, when it didn't fit, really, he didn't immediately discard the world. He had to decide the case, and so he used other ways. He did other things. Contrast, if you know American law, him with Easterbrook, who was his student in Chicago, who said, does economic analysis of law, and gets all sorts of absurd results as a judge. The other thing is, why should it be that a lawyer does this, look at the theory, and question it? Why should it be a lawyer rather than someone else? Coase, after all, was not a lawyer. He was an institutional economist, an institutionalist school of economics. The man who put this stuff in the casebook in courts, and who had then long since gone and died and never done anything with it, which led me, reading this casebook, to say, hey, how about doing this, was an institutional economist. Why should it be a lawyer rather than an institutional economist? And there, the reason I think is more political. Traditionally, institutional economists were of the left. And because they were of the left, what they did when they looked at the world and questioned economics was suspected. Oh, that's just ideology. Uh, Coase himself, who became a libertarian, free market person when he wrote The Problem of Social Cost, which got paid attention to, though he hates to admit, in the 1920s, when he wrote The Theory of the Firm, was a socialist. Which is why he said, hey, you know, markets cost money. Market free enterprise is not just cheap. So it was his suspicion. There is always suspicion if economists do what I call law and economics. The advantage of having lawyers do it is that as lawyers, we come in all descriptions. There are right-wing lawyers, center-wing lawyers, left-wing lawyers, but we are always of necessity institutionalists. As lawyers, we have to deal with the real world. And when the theory doesn't fit, were led to say, not vague generalities, but let's test the theory. That's what we do as lawyers. So we're particularly good at doing this thing. And it's doing this thing which has become the other part of this use of economics in law. Now, why is it that of all these law and ways of changing law, economics has proven to be as successful, as powerful as it has been. Why not law and philosophy, or law and bananas, or law and theology, or law and, and whatever? Well, of course, there's much of that, and law and philosophy right at the moment is having something of a renaissance. But uh, first because you know, law often does deal with economic relationships in very many much more complicated ways than just antitrust. When we talk about accident law, we're saying how many people will get killed, how much safety is worthwhile. You know, we are often asking questions which are also economic in law. And second, because of the fact that economics, among all of the social sciences that we talk about, uh, has managed to be rigorous enough so that it can be applied, whether in an economic analysis of law or in the first instance in law and economics and that, more readily, more powerfully or 
comfortably. And so it has become very, very important. Uh, that very rigor presents two problems. The first problem is that that very rigor may mean that it doesn't fit well. And Arthur Corbin, who was the great, greatest of a legal realist, the great uh, commercial law professor, and himself something of a conservative <coughs> law legal realist, tended to be very much that, at the end of his life wrote a letter to the law faculty at Yale saying, yes, we have been the ones who have pushed law and to get beyond law as a formal doctrine and look to other things. But don't think that these other disciplines are ultimately any more self-contained and correct in themselves. Be as skeptical of them. Use them as a place to question law, to question whether these are vague generalities or not. But don't just buy them as theology. Don't just buy them as the whole thing. But that, I think, is, is very, very important as a criticism of law and economics and of economic analysis of law in relation to others. Now, what happened when people like me started writing about law and economics? and bringing it outside of the United States. In 1965, I was writing a book, The Cost of Accidents, and I was in Rome, and I was invited by Konrad Seiker, who is the great god of German law, to go to the Max Planck in Hamburg to talk about the work I was doing. I had written these early articles, in law and economics, and they didn't notice, and so I went there. And I went and gave a seminar at the Max Planck, explaining what I was doing. It's 1965. And at the end of my seminar, Zweiger, who, as I say, was the god of German law, and Germany then is now tends to think of itself as being the god of most everything else. Uh, and Zweiger looked for forward and said, that is very interesting, Calabresi, that is very interesting, but you must understand that that is not law and it is not legal scholarship. Well, I was very young, 1965, but I'd already gotten tenure, I was already a full professor at Yale, I'd gotten tenure very, very quickly, because 12 or something, I don't know. Uh, when, uh, because of these articles. And as a good Italian, I wasn't all that fond of Germans. <laughs> and so I answered rather rudely, uh, it may not be now, but it soon will be. And at that point, the two people at either side of Zweiger started to laugh. And Zweiger looked at them as only a hell professor can do. And they stopped in mid life. <laughs> but the interesting thing is that each of them subsequently became the head of Max Planck. And that there are people going around the world now who not only think that law and economics or economic analysis of law is law and legal scholarship, but they the only thing that is law and legal scholarship, which of course is completely stupid. It is one way to do it. Why was there a hesitancy to accept this way, law and general, and therefore law and economics, outside of the United States, so that it has only been accepted more slowly, though now very powerfully in many places? I think there were two reasons. One, that the tradition of the formal way of looking at law in Europe was extremely strong. And remained strong 
for an odd and interesting reason. The formal way of looking at law was very strong all over the world in the 19th century. It was only at the beginning of the 20th century that in the United States it started to break down. Think about what was happening in Germany and in Italy, and therefore other countries are out looking at it, in the mid-20th mid century, 1920s and 30s. Fascism and Nazism came in. The formal, traditional way of looking at law was profoundly, is profoundly conservative. That is, if the values are there and law can't be changed, if reforming law isn't scholarship, it's the juris condemnum, it's changing law, it's not what one should do, this becomes an enormous weapon against those who would change law so that it serves the values of the dictatorship. So the great Italian legal scholars who were anti-fascist became total formalists. And the people in Germany who wanted to save what could be saved of decency became total formalists. While in the United States, instead, law and started to win out. In Italy and in Germany, the formal approach became the approach of the poor people. There was only one scholar in Italy who was a real scholar and not a fascist pack who did law and kind of things. And he happened to have been a professor and dean and president of Rome. He became a great friend of Roscoe Pound, the great Harvard dean who was a uh, uh, very much a law and person. And the reason was that he happened to be one of relatively few people who was both fascist and a real scholar. His name was Giorgio De Vecchio. He was a cousin of my grandmother's, actually. He was the only fascist in my family. We were all strongly anti-fascist. That's why we had to leave. And we ostracized him. You know, we didn't speak to this man. But he was the only one who, in an American sense, was a modern scholar. So that tradition remained, and there were a few people in Italy who, after the war, who had been strong anti-fascist and formalists, said, now we can be functionalists. Now we can look to law and. Uh, Alan Andre and Ascarelli here in Italy wrote articles after the war saying that. And somebody else wrote, but what about the next dictatorship? Tying yourself to something conservative has an advantage if you are afraid that human beings only make things worse. Whether it's a gold standard or some area of law that somehow got there regardless. Reforming is only okay and means of reform if you think that reform is likely to be good. It's democratic reform or what have you. So that there was a reluctance in Europe because of this history to abandon law as a fixed formal thing. Today I think that probably is not well served. The other reason was a more narrowly technical one and that is that by chance, both I and Coase, in writing about law and economics, first wrote about areas in the United States which are common law areas, court-made law areas, courts, property, and so on, not statutory areas, but as a matter of chance. It was that I got excited about this in my first course in torts, 
uh, and I don't know why Colt did it in that, but it is just chance. So that we addressed what we were saying about law and economics and developing law to courts. Why? Because these were areas that in the United States, courts were the makers of law. To Europeans, addressing this to courts seemed an anathema. Courts don't have the power in Europe to make law in that way. And that made what we were saying seem bizarre. These people are asking courts to do certain things which they can't do in Europe. But that misunderstands the analysis and whom it is directed to. Many of the things that we were saying that were directed to courts could just as easily be written directing them to legislatures or to administrative agencies or to whoever were the lawmakers in Europe. So that the analysis remained the same, this law makes no sense, you legislature changed it. And that is beginning to be understood that what we were saying focused on courts can just as well be said focusing on legislation. And that's why now economic analysis of law is becoming more accepted throughout the world. Uh, I've got to say that there are some people who understood this right away at the same time that Conrad Streicher was saying this isn't law, this isn't legal scholarship. A man named Guido Tedeschi, who was a, a founder of the Hebrew University Law School in Jerusalem and the, pre and the teacher of such great people as Aaron Barak, a great judge, uh, the president of the Israeli uh, Constitutional Court, and, and of everybody else there, who was an Italian who left uh, to go there, uh, and who is a distant relative uh, of mine. Everybody's a relative. Everybody's a student. Everybody's a relative of mine. And, you know, this stuff's going to You're old enough if you can claim that. It doesn't matter whether it's true or not. Uh, and he read my first article. He himself was very much a formalist because he was a nephew of this guy who was the fascist in the family and who hated what that guy stood for. He was very much a formalist. Uh, but when he read my first article, instead of reacting that cycle, he said, it's very different from what I do, but it seems important, and that's all that matters. That is, he was willing to say, this way of looking at law is important too. Now, I'm going to spend the next couple of lectures applying law and economics to certain things that economists have not done. To altruism, beneficence, why do we have it? What is it? How can we handle it? And then to the most difficult thing of all, of what can we say about law and values and shaping tastes. That's what I'll do tomorrow, this afternoon. I'll talk about, uh, uh, about altruism. Uh, but in, before that, in kind of pulling this today together, uh, I'd like you to think about which of these ways of looking at law makes sense. If you were asking seriously, do we own our body parts? <coughs> if you're a legislator or a judge, or an administrator, and the question comes up, do we own our body parts, or do they belong to the person who needs it? That question, that science fiction question I asked, how would you like to answer that question? I happen to think that you don't look for an answer to it 
in only one way. I think that there is something to be said for the purely formal because the purely formal includes the whole unanalyzed wisdom experience of the human race. Unanalyzed, it's just there. Why were the codes written that way? Why did the common law know? I don't know. It may be exploitation. It may be bad reasons. But it may also be experience and wisdom. So one ought to be aware of that. Might be conservative. But be aware. And then look at it also from the standpoint of each of the different law ends. What does economics tell you about this? And often it will tell you that makes no sense, or it will tell you I can't explain it, and you do law and economics, and you make the economics more complicated, and then you can explain it. But what does law and philosophy tell you? And which different schools? And then don't stop there, but look at literature. You know, you can learn a lot about law, and what makes sense in law from literature. It is often said, for instance, that people are not affected by simply reading or what they see on television in terms of sexual behavior or actions and so on. And that may be true. And it doesn't mean that if they are, that we want to stop. But if you go back to Dante, Paolo and Francesca were reading a French book which got them so sexually excited they started to make love, which ended up in a disaster. <laughs> there are insights in literature that tell you about relationships of law that are also worth doing. But then when you've done that, ask yourself also a question of who ought to make these decisions. And that's a question which also speaks to discrimination. Legislation, oh yes, wonderfully democratic. But democratic often means that the outsider treated, gets treated as an outsider. That the person who is just above that person treats them badly. Courts, precisely because they're elite institutions, which may make them bad at deciding some things, can sometimes look after the little guy better than the democratic. On the other hand, there are some things, depending on how courts are chosen. On the other hand, there are some things in which administrative agencies do best because you have more knowledge. So look at it from a legal process point of view, too. And then when you're done with that, go back and re-ask all of these questions, not in generic terms, but in terms of how does it affect women? What is the history of this? Who is best suited to protect women? Courts, legislatures? Where, when, huh? Gays? The poor? You know, look at it, racial groups. Look at it from the standpoint of law and status, and we ask those questions. Which of these is law? Which is the way to ask the really difficult questions of law? Like, when do I own my body part? And when don't I know? I think all of them are. I've played at law and economics. And I think I've done some interesting, useful things in it. But as a judge, I hope that I'm well beyond doing just that. But looking at law in all of these things, you try to answer the questions tragic questions often, questions which any answer to can be awful and yet has to be made in the human condition. To try to answer them, not perfectly, but tolerably well. Okay, thank you.
now I'm available to answer questions and uh, about anything. About what we talked about, but also about the shift, what a judge does. Um, the only thing is that I'm part of hearing, and these things work more or less well. And so when I teach uh, in New Haven, it's a fairly large class, I go up and ask people questions. And at first, they all think that I'm being very nice and polite. It's only later that I tell them that I do it because I couldn't hear the other way. <laughs> so try to speak up, and if uh, uh, I um, don't hear you, don't be surprised if I come up to you and ask you to say it again loud and clear. So questions, if, there, uh, if uh, you don't ask questions, I'll start calling on you, which is uh, not fair. Come on. My name is Joe, I'm from Ukraine. You're from Ukraine? Yeah, yeah. So from your point of view, do people own their body parts? Do people own their body parts? Sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes yes and sometimes no. Uh, now, let me, uh, for example, do you think uh, we don't like, people generally don't like the idea of uh, having a market in body parts. Now, do they not like the idea of having a market in body parts because we don't want to put a price on them, because pricing them is in itself something that we don't like. We say life is a pearl beyond price, and we don't want to price it. And yet we price it in a way all the time, that is, we take it because it costs too much to save it. We don't want to put a price on it. Is that the problem with body parts? Or is the problem a different one? that we don't mind, would not mind having a price on it, so long as it wasn't a price which reflected the generalized distribution of wealth, so that only the rich could buy and not the poor. That is, if we had a market in body parts in which everybody had as much money, or which which treated body parts as what I call elsewhere a merit good as something, would we want to say there are some people who would rather have more money and live less long, and others who would give up everything because they're writing the great book on body parts? But which is it? I think, in fact, body parts sometimes belong to us and sometimes belong to those who need them. A lot depends on how we do it. If there were a generalized Chernobyl and a law was passed that everybody who had good body parts went into the army or not, and had to give them up to those who need them. Would that be constitutional or not? I think it would be constitutional if it were a general law. But if instead it would be this kind of law, everybody goes into the army, but it turns out, just by chance, that those who have good body parts are those who have recessive sickle cell anemia. That is, those we call black. Or those who had Tay-Sachs, those we call Jews. Or it turned out that women were those who could give, were universal donors. Then we should be suspicious of such a donor. That is, I think, to put it in U.S. terms, that the issue is one when it becomes a violation of equal protection. Then courts have to protect people. When it's a violation of due process, it's a different. Let me step into the most difficult 
one of the most difficult issues of all, abortion. If men became pregnant, as well as women, and the state decided to have a law against abortion for men and women both, because it valued the life interest of the fetus enough, I would not be ready to hold that law unconstitutional. Far from it. I'd say that this is a society that thinks that your body belongs to somebody else, the fetus, and that's fine. But it's quite a different thing if that society says women must give up their bodies for fetuses. Men don't need to. And it's not because that society wants to discriminate against women necessarily. When there is intentional discrimination, that's difficult to deal with, but it can be dealt with. The far more insidious thing is when a society says, I want to protect fetuses so long as I don't need to bear the burden. So long as only they, whoever they are, bear the burden. Think of this in a variety of ways. I want planes to be safe but only people who look like Arabs get searched when they get on planes. Dope is a terrible thing, so I will go into public housing and search for it. Or you search everybody. If we are willing to put a burden on all of us, that's a very different, a very different kind of thing. It's not unrelated to the reason we have uh, to compensate when we take land to make a park or a railroad. We all want a park so long as we don't need to pay for it. Easy enough to say protect fetuses so long as it's only they who pay for it. Now, the difficulty, of course, with respect to abortion and fetuses and body parts is that men don't become pregnant. If it became pregnant, would we have laws against abortion? Maybe we would, maybe we would not. Different countries would decide differently. I'm not so libertarian that I don't think such laws would be valid. Well, I sometimes joke and say, suppose you were in a state that wanted to protect fetuses, but in a non-discriminatory way. You might say, all right, women cannot have abortion, but men must give up their body parts, their kidneys, their bone marrows, to those who need them. We are a society in which bodies belong to those who need them, and that's that. And men bear a burden. It's not the same. We can't make it the same, but at least it's a show of earnest that in this state, men don't own their bodies just as women don't. When I say that, especially to men, they say, good heavens, no, you shouldn't make that a matter of law. Maybe of morality, but you should get it. So fine, you were saving the world. Uh, then somebody says, ah, but it's only women who engage in sex who need to worry about abortion. I said, that's easy. Only men who engage in sex need to give up their body parts to most of them. <laughs> Those who don't, they can keep them freely. And, and so that, that's an easy way to deal with. But my answer is, look, I am as fond of my body parts as any. They serve me well for, I'm almost eight. Uh, oh yes, I could use your hair. Uh, but I'm not sure I'd want any other part of you. <laughs> it all served me quite well uh, over these years. Uh, on the other hand, I do think 
that there are many things which we ought to think about giving to those who need more easily. Because, you see, people are going to come knocking at our door and say, I need these. You have them. And if we don't think hard about who has a right to get them, we're likely either to act like Marie Antoinette, who says, it's my right, go away until the revolution comes and you lose it. Or J.P. Morgan, it's my right, property, not status, until a much calmer revolution, the new deal comes, and the same, you lose it. Or worse, we may do what is so often done, which is when the people who need come to our door and ask for what we have, and we haven't done anything more than say, it's mine, it's my right, it's natural that it should be mine. That's what Marie Antoinette thought, that's what gave me thought. We then tend to say, oh, it's not me who's keeping you who is at the door from getting yours. In Russia, it's not me, the wealthy, who are keeping you before, it's the Jews! And then the pogroms come. That is, the tendency to say it's always the little guy, the person outside, who is keeping me from me, is very easy. Take the body parts from people who are in jail. You know? Take them from the poor, but rather than from all of us. And that society was first. Rather long winded answer to you. Very good question. And do tell me where you're from. I'm Shanti. And I'm from India. Um, I have a question for you. The first thing you mentioned that by making a decision of the judge, right, there's always those hard cases in the death penalty. Yeah. So I'd, be, I'd really like to know how you decide those cases. You're imputing a sense okay. of morality. Uh, let me tell you, the question was, how does a judge decide a situation like a death penalty? Uh, I became a judge late in life. Uh, I finished being dean for 10 years at the Yale Law School, and uh, the Clintons, Hillary, who had been students there, decided that they wanted me to be a judge. So I had no judicial career. This is not a, that odd in the United States, but uh, I hadn't planned to be a judge, hadn't thought about it. Uh, and uh, in fact, when people had asked me, I said, I'm not particularly interested, but when the President of the United States asked you to do something which you can do it, which is honorable. It never occurred to me that Clinton might ask me to do something not honorable. But uh, <laughs> the, uh, 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 you say, yes, it's not the judge. At the time I became a judge, there was no death penalty in any of the states in which I had jurisdiction. I'm a federal judge, I'm like federal, New York, Vermont, New York is what connected. Connecticut nominally had it, but in a way that was virtually impossible to apply. And I don't know if I would have become a judge, if I would have accepted, if there had been a death penalty, because I feel very strongly about it. I think the death penalty is uh, immoral for religious reasons and also totally from a utilitarian point of view, it doesn't do anything. It's just, uh, I think it's wrong at every, at every level of the thing. And we can talk more about that if you want, about why I think that and why I do think why it remains in the United States as one of the very few developed countries which has it. Uh, since then, what happened was 
that for a while New York had it, but then a great chief judge in New York, Judith Kay, there was a great moment when the chief judges, chief justices of New York, Connecticut, and Massachusetts were women. Ellen Peters, my colleague, the great <coughs> chief justice of Connecticut, Margaret Marshall, uh, the great chief justice of Massachusetts, and Judith Kay of New York, and these three were fantastic judges. And Judith Kay found a way in the court in the New York Constitution to strike it down. Uh, but it now exists federal, and it exists in Connecticut. Step back. What makes being a judge interesting? Every once in a while, you have the great opinion to write. You know? An opinion that makes the case books that people cite and so on. And I won't hide from you that that's fun. I don't care how old you are, you like merit badges. It's kind of nice when you write a great opinion and some scholar somewhere whom you respect says, oh, that's Guido at his best. But frankly, that's also something you can do by writing articles. You know, we've had a great article in that. Then there are all the ordinary cases that you have, which my colleagues in the academy say, aren't they boring? They're little cases which are fairly easy, uh, and don't they bore you? The answer to that is, no, they're fun too. You try to write something which is elegant, which does just what is needed to solve the case, and they say, it isn't just doing that after a while boring. The answer is no, because when you look at them, you then change things in your mind so that they become more complicated, so when the first case of that sort comes up, it's an easy one, which is lucky because you don't know anything about that, but anything a judge, I know nothing about bankruptcy or about any number of other things, but the cases were easy. If you start to play with them and make them difficult, so that by the time the really hard case in an area you knew nothing about, you've already played with it and you've already thought about it. So that's intellectually interesting because you're always speculating on it. But that isn't what makes being a judge really worthwhile. What makes being a judge worthwhile is when the law is wrong. You know, when you come in and the law is wrong and it's immoral. And then you wake up and you're bound to follow the law. You've taken the oath to do it. And what you do then is you wake up in the middle of the night and you try to see if that is actually the law. If there is a way within the law, being loyal to what you are asked to do, and have taken an oath to do, to come out in the way that you think is moral and right. And you use all the skills the good Lord gave you. All the brains you have to try to come out right. And I say you wake up in the middle of the night, that's if it's just a case that has come up. But if it is something like a capital case, and you're somebody like me, long before you get it, and even if you don't know that you are going to get it, because you may go up to another panel of my court, you follow it, and you watch it, and you look to see whether a judge has made a mistake a mistake other people might not have seen. So if it ever comes up to you, you can say no. And you do that. Well, in the ordinary art case, you wake up in the middle of the night, and the great moments are the times that you find that, you, that the law was not what other people thought that there is a way properly in the law, as it is, to come out in the way that is right. And the next morning, you come to court, we sit in panels of three, and you say to the other judges, you know, everybody's been arguing the law as if it were this, but it's not.
It's this way. And if your court is not an ideological court, and by and large our court still is not, many courts are in the United States, but ours remains a, a pretty much a court of law, you'll find at least one, and often two, the other judges who say, you know, we know that case has been bothering me too. I'm glad you found that. And I smile because say, if it bothered you more, you would have woken up in the middle of the night. Uh, and there are cases that bother them and not me. And then the case comes out right. And the next night, you sleep very well. And of course, that is the thing that gives you the greatest pleasure. Now, what happens, though, if you can't come up with a way? Well, you can, in the American system, write a concurring opinion, which says, I'm stuck following the law, but the law is wrong. And that's kind of nice, because then you're writing for history. You say, everybody else is wrong, I am right, and here it is, and look, glorious, all poor me, but there it is. And that, by the way, is a terrible temptation. <coughs> T.S. Eliot, whom I don't write because he's a nasty man, but he's a great poet, uh, wrote in Murder of the Cathedral, The Temptation to Martyrdom. The Temptation to Be a Martyr. And there is that, you know, the temptation to say, oh, I'm terrible, I'm stuck doing this awful thing, and here it is, and I write for history. And of course, it's a particularly easy temptation because when you're a real martyr, you're the one who gets killed. When in here, uh, somebody else gets it in the neck and you are writing the great thing. Now, you can't do that all the time or you would become so insufferable with your colleagues that they would never listen to you. But in the great case, you can do it. And occasionally, you know, occasionally you can do that. I've just written a concurring opinion saying that the Supreme Court is completely wrong in, fi uh, in campaign financing. And it's a very nice little opinion, and it's very elegant, and it's fine, and, uh, and, and uh, okay. But you, you try to avoid that temptation and try to see if there is some way and not just right there. There may be a case. In the case of capital punishment, it has not yet happened to me. We don't have many. And in each case that we have had, I either found something wrong. In one case, I found something wrong, and then the jury didn't sentence the people to death, uh, but I found that the court, the trial court, a great judge had made a mistake. And afterwards, and I was ready to strike it down, if strike the death penalty down, if the jury had come in with the death penalty. And afterwards, I saw this old judge and I said, you know, who had written the book on procedure of that, I said, you made a mistake here. And he said, what? And I looked at him and he said, oh, God, you're right. You know, so you, you do that and sometimes you think, but what would happen if you ever had a case where you couldn't do it? And I said, it's not happened to me yet with the with capital punishment. I think if it did, it would be between me and my God that I would apply it because I have sworn an oath to follow the law. If that happens, the one thing you cannot do is to put the burden on the person who is suffering. It is to ask that person to forgive you. You don't have a right to do that. Lewis Pollock taught me constitutional law was great, and then became a judge, a trial judge in Pennsylvania. And he was a very sweet man, still a judge of 87, and very sensitive and so on. When he first became a judge, had to sentence somebody to a sentence which was much too long. But he had to do it. He tells the story of himself, and please excuse my language, but that's happened. And after he sentenced the man, he got off the bench, feeling very sorry, and put his arm around him and said, I'm terribly, terribly sorry that I had to do this. And the man looked at him and said, fuck you. <laughs> well, absolutely right. I mean, Lou, as Lou said, 
What right do you have to tell me how sorry you are? I'm the one who's going to go to jail for 40 years because you applied for that sort. So you have no right to do that. If that ever happened, you know, so far, it has not happened to me in a capital case. Now, let me give you what is really the hard case. Suppose when you wake up in the middle of the night, you find a way, an argument, because of which it is plausible that the law was wrong and doesn't need to apply. The only problem is that you don't believe it. That is, if it didn't involve capital punishment, a result that you can't stand, you wouldn't buy that argument. What do you do? Suppose you are, as I am, very convincing and well thought of by my colleagues. If I came in and said, here is an argument because of which the law is wrong, which I don't believe, they might buy it. If I came in and said, here is an argument because of which the law is wrong, I don't buy it, but I wish you would. They won't buy it. You as lawyers don't have that problem. A lawyer has a right to come in and make any argument that is a plausible argument. A lawyer must tell the truth, but they don't have to believe their argument. It isn't up to you to decide what is a good argument of law. It's up to the judge. So you have a perfect right to come in and make an argument if you don't believe it. If a judge leaned from the bench and said, you believe that, counsel, the answer is, that's not my business. It's a good argument. You tell me. But as a judge, when you come into another panel, that's different. In that situation, what do I do? If I wrote, if I said, I believe it, convinced the other two judges, and then dissented, and they killed me, that would be justifiable homicide. What do I do in that situation? Do I buy the argument? Do I put the argument that I don't believe in order, in effect, lie to my colleagues to bring about the right result? Or do I present the argument that say I don't buy it and get a result which I think is horrible? I have not had that situation. I have not had that situation, but I pose it to people and I get the most diverse answers from people. From some who say it is perfectly obvious that you have to follow, you can't apply to your colleagues. And from others who say it's ridiculous, of course you must bring about the result that is right. So I guess I'll decide that one when I come to it. Where from? Australia. Oh. Um, I thought what you said was really interesting about the death penalty. I had a question a bit in relation to that. Um, I noted you said that had you been, um, when you became a judge, had it been in jurisdiction with the death penalty, it might have been a different decision, or it might not have been. And I was wondering, um, in jurisdictions where there are the death penalty, I I'd imagine that that's a question that plays on a lot of future judges' minds. Do you think that issues like that affect the makeup of judges on the bench and whether that's an issue for the fact that judges, to an extent, should be interpreting social values and being presented to the population? Very good point. Uh, she asks whether the fact that I said I don't know whether I would if, I, uh, uh, if there had been a death penalty have become a judge, does that mean that in jurisdictions where there are laws that are immoral to someone, the judges won't come who think that they're immoral and that biases the makeup of judges. Uh, and I'm very aware of that because, of course, I could have resigned from the bench once the death penalty came in 
in these jurisdictions, or now I'm senior enough, I'm a senior judge, so I could, if I wanted to, not hear their penalty cases. I could recuse myself from all of those. And I have consciously decided not to because I don't want the judges to be there to be only ones who are not troubled by the death penalty, to be biased in that direction. I don't want to be conscious pilot and wash my hands of it and say, it's you guys. And so I'm willing to put myself in this situation where I may someday have to apply that rather than have only judges who don't worry about it be there. And I do think that there is a tendency both in courts and in juries when you have laws that are terribly unfair to have people say, then I won't take part. And I don't think that's right. On the other hand, what can I say about a person who feels so strongly about it that they cannot be? Potter Stewart, who was a justice of the Supreme Court of the United States and a graduate of my law school, uh, together with a man named Byron White, who was also a graduate of our school and we were good friends, found a way of striking down all of the death penalty laws and sending them back, but not ultimately unconstitutional. It was their hope that very few states would repass them and that they then could say it is cruel and unusual punishment. In fact, it didn't work out that way for some complicated reasons, so that they couldn't ultimately strike down the death. Uh, he was on the Supreme Court, and he found himself upholding a death penalty. And then very shortly after, he resigned. One thought he was well, he just resigned. No explanation. Shortly after, not long after, he did die. But nothing. And I was asked, because I was dean at Yale, because this was his school, to speak at the Supreme Court memorial for him. And I was there, and all of Washington was in front of me. And I said that I thought that he had left the court because he could not bear to apply the death penalty, and having tried to knock it down, and couldn't get that off. And all of Washington in front of me went, <gasps> except his wife, who was sitting there, and he went, <laughs> if they asked me, as a judge, actually to pull the lever, to kill the person. I couldn't do that. And I'd get off. So I understand recusing, but it does have the danger, and the very severe danger, of biasing the law in one direction. By the way, something else happens, which is quite interesting. Uh, there are judges who, in that situation, and Byron White is one of them, become automatons. That is, because they are against the death penalty, they then apply it automatically and without thinking in every case in which it comes up. Now that seems odd. But they convince themselves that they are no more than la bouche de la loi, the mouth of the law, and that they have no choice in the matter, because then it isn't that they're simply tools in the hands of the law. But that's terrible, because of course they do have a choice. They could wake up in the middle of the night, but they protect themselves by convincing themselves that they have no choice. And that's what happened to White. Potter Stewart got off the bench. White, when he remained, became 
Absolutely, okay. You put it back, it's you guys, it's not me, it's your fault, not mine, and there it is. Now there is a historical antecedent for this, which is quite fascinating. And my late great colleague, Bob Covert, wrote a book called Justice Accused, which is a wonderful book that you, you should read. And it deals with the judges before the Civil War in the United States who were abolitionists, who were strongly against slavery, but who enforced the fugitive slave laws fiercely. The fugitive slave laws were that the slaves escaped from the South. There was a federal law that said that they had to be sent back from the North. And you had these judges who politically, actively, were anti-slavery, abolitionists, and yet almost all of them, with respect to these laws, they applied them to us. And Cover asks himself a question of why. And he comes up with this answer of cognitive dissonance of saying that it was awful enough so that they felt they had to. Now, there's an interesting literary connection to this. The greatest of these was a man named Lemuel Shaw, who was Chief Justice of Massachusetts, and who, as a judge in Massachusetts, was enormously willful and activist. He redid all of tort law and all of contract law. He was a great creator of the new 19th century law. So a judge, tremendous power, tremendous thing, fiercely anti-slavery, I think related to the Shaw, who was a head of a black regiment who was killed in the South and has been much honored and so on. Uh, and yet, when it came to the future of slave law, he was absolutely fierce. And it's him. Uh, T, who, who cover is writing about. The interesting thing about Shaw is that he had a son-in-law who was greater than he was, not in law, but in literature. His son-in-law, whom he loved and he helped financially and so on, is Herman Melville, the writer, who wrote the novella Billy Budd in which Captain Veer, proof Veer, kills Billy Budd, executes Billy Budd, because the law requires it, even though it is unjust. And Melville, this great writer, writing about his father of law, <coughs> writing about slavery, because everything that people knew that Billy Budd in some ways was about slavery. Billy Budd was struck down and couldn't testify, and slaves couldn't testify in court and so on. But they didn't know about this relationship. He's asking himself, did he really need to do it? I don't think so. A great writer, this is why law and literature is just important to me now, was saying, no, there was a way Captain Veer failed. This is In that analysis, Tell me who you are. I'm Harry Jones. In analysis, you mentioned a few I mean, examples of people who are professors or I mean, scholars in the law and economics field, at the same time, legal practitioners, including yourself. And I notice you know, kind of this kind of difference with how they analyze the perceived things in the academic field and how it has been able to practice in the legal things. So I was just thinking because um, we're not just into this field because of the purpose of academia, but also to achieve this which can be translated into practice. So how has how do you play both how do you do these theoretical things when you get into practice? It, what my question is then, um, how has the analysis in the law and economics field impacted on the law in practice in America, for example. And what do you think is the future of this movement? I mean, the translation of these analyses into the practical field. So, uh, the answer is that if you think that you could come to court and draw a marginal cost curve 
and think that that would convince a court to decide your way, even in an antitrust case, you would probably be very foolish. Courts and decision makers do not rely on the academy and what the academy thinks that directly. It's a great mistake of people to think that, and it's a mistake that is made both by people in the academy who get mad if what they write doesn't get picked up and applied immediately to the real world, and of people in the real world who are always writing and saying, those academicians aren't writing things which are useful to us today. Of course not. They are different jobs. They are different jobs. And uh, the most foolish thing of people in the academy is to think that what they write should be taken up immediately. <coughs> In fact, if any of you become professors, just remember that the freedom you have as professors to write and do what you think is the truth derives from the fact that the real world ignores you as a professor for a time. I don't know if you've heard the saying, do justice though the heavens fall, it's an old maxim of the common law. If a judge caused the heavens to fall, that judge wouldn't last as a judge two days. He'd be out on his butt. They'd pull him out immediately. But as an academician, you can write what you think is just though the heavens fall, because the heavens don't fall. You write the article which would reform an area, and people in the real world will say, ah, she never met a payroll. Very interesting. Ah, he never held a job. That doesn't mean that this kind of thing doesn't affect what law becomes. We're writing law. We're not writing mathematics when we're doing legal scholarship. We're doing things which affect the real world. What scared me as a professor was how quickly some of my theories came to be introduced into legal rules by practitioners who then suggested some part which they thought that some lawmaker would do, would put in, because it would serve their clients and thought, you know, this one is okay. People in the real world take these things and make them into things which look like legal rules, which then courts and others will apply. So I can find today any number of legal rules that as a judge I apply, which I can trace back to a series of steps to the kinds of things that I wrote long ago. And that's kind of fun. Though maybe the lawyer who is presenting it to me has no idea what the derivation, what the ancestry of these things are. <coughs> when and where you play these things as a practitioner more or less directly, depends on the case. What is the case, the issue? Is it an issue in which the law is already, in a formal sense, pretty clear? Or is it something new that is open? It depends on whom you're arguing to. Is it a body that can make new rules? An administrative agency which is thinking about what to do about a whole area or a legislative committee, or whether it's a court that is bound by precedent, and whether that area, even if it is bound by precedent, is open. There's no generic on it. You as a practitioner, that's what makes being a practitioner fun, 
have to take these law and theories and see whether this is the moment where some part of it which will serve your client will work or whether it does not. And I, as a judge, will both help you and hinder you. That is, as a judge, I'll look down and say, oh, come on now, you're not giving me this kind of abstract nonsense. But we'll listen at the same time. And sometimes I can do it. It's quite interesting. There was a case involving punitive damages, extra contractual damages, extra compensatory damages, in which there are two cases. One came up in the Seventh Circuit in Chicago, and the other came up before mine. And in the same case, same issue, Posner, using economic analysis of law directly, imposed a certain result. He was willing to do it like that. In my case, I wrote the opinion which decided the case narrowly, in a way, and then I wrote an opinion concurring in my own opinion, but a separate opinion, agreeing with me in the result, but saying that there's more to it, and making the same argument that Posner independently was using to decide. I was more cautious. I didn't want to go all the way with the economic analysis in that one. He was willing to go further. He was more aggressive. He's a more activist in a true sense of the word judge than I am. Uh, but we both thought that this was an area where you could speak pretty directly in terms of fear. So the answer is, the theory becomes one of the sources of law in a world in which what are the sources of lawmaking to different <coughs> bodies are different and many. It's not just hard law, not just a case or a statute, but theories, decisions of other jurisdictions are all relevant to the arguing of law. And this becomes one of the weapons that you have, or if you're on the other side, one of the weapons you better guard against when people use it. The more it takes hold, the more the next time you can add to it. But don't think that it is there directly or something that you can use without more in our human case. Thank you, back there. Thank you. about the law and economic school. Uh, you mentioned it, it works like this. There's a theory and uh, here is the world and then you apply the theory to the world and if it doesn't make sense, you go back to the theory and uh, then you refine it. Um, I'm a little bit confused because it seems to me it's only, this school is only descriptive. Is there any like nominal, nominal element in this theory? Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's interesting, Dave. Uh, uh, a, uh, my fourth book called, uh, what's it called? Uh, <laughs> uh, it's about law and values. The fourth book that I've just written uh, has just been translated into Chinese. And it's been translated into Chinese uh, precisely uh, because it is a an application of the earlier books, which were more law and economics. Uh, it's called Ideals, Beliefs, and the Law in English. And I don't know what the Chinese word would be. But to apply it in, uh, in a way that is somewhat critical of it. Uh, the question is, when you do either law and economics, going down and then back, or economic analysis of law, just going down, is that just descriptive or is it normative? Dick Posner claims that when he does economic analysis of law, he is just being descriptive. That he is just looking 
and seeing if it fits. And if it fits, it says it fits. And if it doesn't fit, it says it doesn't fit. And leaves it at that. I think that is dishonest. That is, there is something about economics which, if you have it on your side, you have a very powerful weapon normatively. So that when somebody does that and says it doesn't fit, you're not just saying, vague generality, it doesn't fit, but you're also saying nonsense change it. And that's what makes it both useful to people. That's why they do it. Otherwise, they wouldn't do it. They do it because it helps change the law. Uh, and the same is true about law and economics. You go down, you go back up, and you uh, say, now we have something that explains and may explain other things. So I think it is inevitably normal even though there are people, like Posner, who say, oh no, I'm not doing any of it. But let's face it, the reason law is so interesting is precisely that it is normative. That it deals with real people in real situations and what ought to be. What makes law special is that by tradition it is rigorous, and by necessity it is normative. Well, the social sciences tend either to be fuzzy and not rigorous, or to say, oh, I'm not normative. I, I just describe. I'm not saying anything. In fact, we are constantly fighting for words. If we say something is the law, we're saying something very powerfully normative. We're saying something about how it ought to be. If we say economics, says this is efficient or this is not, we are saying to people, do it unless you give me another good reason. So don't hide behind the notion that I'm just being descriptive. You're not. You're not. And that calls on you all the more to be careful. And not just say, because economics says that, that is necessarily right, but to go back and forth. By the way, uh, this going back and forth is somewhat more complicated than I have described. Sometimes, when you use a theory, a model, and look at the law, and it doesn't fit the world as you see it, it isn't that the theory is wrong. It's that you haven't been looking at the world fully. That your view of what the world is, is not accurate. And that rather than changing the theory, you should say, is that really the world that I was describing? And this came up dramatically in a little article that I wrote called Property Rules, Liability Rules, Inalienability Rules, One View of a Cathedral. This article, commonly called the Cathedral, is said to be the private law article that has been most quoted of any article at any time. It all depends how you define private law. Okay. But it certainly has been cited a lot. And what it did was to take some rules of property law, you know, make a model, an economic model, and say there's a fourth rule here, there's a fourth thing here, there's a gap. And ask, is that gap there? What's going on? It would look as though the world didn't fit the model, the theory. But it turned out that the reason the gap was there was not that there was a gap at all, but that we were only looking at appellate cases. And appellate cases were not likely to fit that fourth situation. 
But if you looked at the world from the standpoint of administrative law, that Fort Rarea was full. So it was the world which we had not seen accurately as lawyers, and the theory caused us to look at the world. And that's another way in which theory can be useful. It can make us say, hey, the world is more complicated. So going back and forth is the way I describe it, but also sometimes it tells you, makes you, as a lawyer, look beyond the way you're accustomed to looking at the world. You're? I'm Italian. Yeah, Italian. <laughs> uh, I think that my question is related to this last answer to this. But I start from a specific case, which is the Pinto case. The Pinto? The Pinto. Mm -hmm. I, read, I read your comment on the Pinto case. He said that this, this decision was irrational in regard to the risk utility test, which is, which, which is the theory applied to this kind of case. If I well understood, you did not criticize the risk utility test, this, you did not criticize this theory, but at the same time, you said that this irrational decision was correct, was not wrong. So um, my question is, how can you say that this decision was correct under which criteria, even though it was irrational? And on the other side, why you did not criticize at least explicitly the risk of test? Okay. Uh, let me, for some of you, tell you the background of the Pinto case and then Sorry, it's very it's very explain very what it is. Uh, Ford Motor Company made Pinto's car, which had the gas tank in a particular place. And because the gas tank was in that place, every once in a while, not frequently, but every once in a while, if there were a crash, the gas tank would catch fire, explode, and burn all the people who were in the car. In the Pinto case, some children, babies, were burned to death. The case, the family sued, and the law supposedly was the law of negligence. Was Pinto negligent for in making this car this way? Uh, came to court, and a little more complicated than the way I'm giving, but essentially Ford said, here is a cost-benefit analysis. Here is how it would, much it would cost to put the gas tank somewhere else where it would not blow up. And here is the number of people who would be burnt to death if we leave it where it is. And it is sufficiently rare that it doesn't make sense to put the gas engine, gas tank, in a more expensive place. Now, negligence, as it is defined in the United States under the learned hand test, supposedly takes into account the harm that is foreseen, the cost of avoiding it, discounting each, and if it is worthwhile avoiding it, and you don't, then you're negligent, and then you pay. So Ford was making a perfectly rational legal argument that they should not pay. It is that they were not negligent. And it's an argument that in other contexts we do all the time, in a way. I mean, you know, uh, how much anti-fog equipment do we have in an airport at Heathrow or even at Malpensa in contrast with an airport in Arizona? We have very little in Arizona because there's very little fog. Occasionally there's fog. 
And it might save an accident in the very rare occasion, but nobody thinks it's worthwhile putting the anti-thought in question. So the argument, rationally, that Pinto made, that they were not negligent in putting the gas tank where they put it, is one which would seem to be OK. But the court got absolutely furious and said, you are standing here and telling us that it is worthwhile burning babies because you don't want to put the tank someplace else? That's the most outrageous thing we've ever heard of. And they sent it to the jury, which gave punitive damages in huge amounts, and said, don't you dare make an argument like this. Well, what's the answer to this? I think the answer is that law is much more subtle and complicated than we think. Yes, we don't mind, actually, if the gas tank is put in the wrong place. We do the equivalent all the time. We make a decision for accidents, for horrible accidents. But there are some things which it is too costly for us to know. It hurts us too much to know that we make decisions that burning babies may be worthwhile. For anybody to come to court and say that, is something that we simply will not let people say. So what are we saying to Pinto? What we're actually saying to Pinto is, if you want to put the gas tank there, and some people get killed, shut up and pay. You know, pay compensation. You may have made the right decision. Don't come to court and tell us that because you've made that decision, you shouldn't pay. It moves that from a negligence test to a strict liability test. Well, why don't we impose strict liability all the time? Maybe we should, but there are all sorts of other areas where a similar argument does not offend us so much and we let people say, oh no, driving this fast is sensible. It's not too risky. We are not willing to say, you are always liable. You decide. There are times when we're willing to say we do a cost-benefit analysis. But there are some cost-benefit analyses that made openly are too awful. And then we won't let you make them. And since we can't draw a line ahead of time that is clear, what we do is not draw a line, but let the defendant know that if they make the wrong argument, wow, the thing. And that comes out giving us a set of legal rules that work out tolerably well. It's not that unusual. In law, often, the shortest distance between two points is not a straight line. Let me give you another example. Mercy killing, euthanasia. Most countries are not willing to say mercy killing, killing somebody who is old and suffering, is all right. To say that says something about life that most of these countries are not willing to say. On the other hand, most of these countries, somebody who actually kills somebody they love because a person is in terrible pain and suffering, we don't want to send that person to jail. So, in the United States, if somebody does that, and comes in and says to a jury, oh, 
I don't know what I was doing. I must have been out of my mind. I saw that person suffering. I just couldn't. I couldn't help myself. I was out of my mind. The jury will acquit every time and say, but if somebody comes in and says, I had a right to do it, I can kill somebody in that, the jury will convict every time. And because juries act that way, the prosecutor won't bring the case of a person who says, oh my goodness, I'm terribly sorry, I don't know what happened, but I did it, and so on. But we'll bring the case of a Dr. Deaf who says, I'm doing it, this is my right to do it. Do we lie? In a way. We are using subterfuges, legal rules in complex ways, to get closer to that result that we want. And that, for me, is the explanation of a video case. Of course. There is a conflict between the two. One more question. There is one. I don't know I got a question myself. Uh, I would like to get back to body parts. <laughs> so uh, let's start. He's from... very interested in body parts. <laughs> I, I'm a collector of body parts. No. Um, Let's start from the difference that we make between renewable sources of energy and non-renewable sources of energy. Would you make a difference, would you say there is a difference between renewable parts of your body, blood, hair, and non-renewable ones, like your nose? Because your hair is renewable. <laughs> the answer is uh, yes. That is, uh, there are several factors if you were dealing with body parts directly. One is, is it something that even though not renewable, we have too many of? Each of us have too many kidneys. We have two, we only need one. If we could be sure that if we gave our kidney to somebody else, we could then, if our remaining kidney went bad, get another one. It's absurd for me to have two kidneys and you to have none. Uh, be careful when I do this. I talked about this in my first class and a very sweet young man in the class that summer went and gave away his kidney to somebody he didn't know because he thought, you know, I'm young. I'll probably do okay. He also, he has a sense of humor, named the kidney he gave away Posner. <laughs> so that that kidney is wandering around. So that there's that distinction. But then the things which, if not, but we don't have too many of them, uh, are renewable. Blood, bone marrow, ova, semen. You know, we have too many. It can be renewed. But there's another distinction, and that is, those things which though we have too many or they are renewable are so connected with who we are that we treat differently. So that blood or hair, renewable, is easy to say, give away or even sell. Semen and ova, that's more complicated because do I really want a thousand little widows wandering around? People who are my sons by giving away my semen? It's rather different than that. The complicated relationship of what it is that is not renewable, what is renewable and does not affect who I am, and who I am is profoundly cultural profoundly cultural, so that in Etruscan society, the liver was who you were. We're more concerned with the heart, or with semen and ova, and also who you are may be different for women and men culturally. Semen and ova may be different. Uh, and the interplay of these is uh, what makes which body parts 
when far more complicated a decision. And body parts, by the way, isn't only body parts, but it's athletic skills. Do they belong to me? Brains. Do they belong to me or to those who need them? Here I am, obviously, a wonderful basketball player, because I'm so tall. I couldn't get a basketball player. Is that mine? Or do people have a right to have me do that? You all are here because you have brains. Is it your duty to use brains for those who need them? Or can you keep the fruit of your brains? Body parts, in this sense, is more complicated even than that. Let me close by telling you a story. And it's the story of brain transplants. Uh, and uh, somebody goes into a doctor and says, I need a brain transplant. And the doctor says, oh, that's easy. We do them all the time. The person's surprised. Yeah, it's just a matter of the money. Uh, and uh, oh, really? uh, there's the brain of uh, a Harvard Law School professor. And it will cost you $20,000. Oh, it's not bad. And then there's a brain of a Yale Law School. Yeah, that will cost you $80,000. Oh, I can understand it. <laughs> and then there's the brain of the dean of the law school. And that will cost you $250,000. $250,000 for the dean. Why? Why? Why so much more? And the doctor said, oh, you must understand, that's never been used. <laughs> <laughs> and you can do the same with parts. <laughs> 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 <laughs>